we we decided to talk about interventions today. Yeah, giving a little thought to talking about interventions. Um, the context really is the, the latter part of the last couple of decades of work uh, at the Laboratory of Comparative Human Cognition. Um, all could be considered in different ways forms of intervention research. Uh, and this begins, this begins well before, when, when we, back in New York when we did the work on ecological validity, we weren't, it, it, we didn't think of it as intervening. That is, we went and we observed in classrooms, we gave the kids tests that we thought would uh, link back to the classroom, and then we created at Rockefeller University in the big lab space, right, that was made for this kind of thing and that I shared with George Miller. Uh, we had this opportunity to create our own activity and then to create activities that we thought would be plausibly have something to do with cognition, remembering, and so on that we could see. And we came up with a cooking club because a cooking club has reading, it has measurement, it has problem solving, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we, then, and in that sense, it wasn't really, you wouldn't think about that as an intervention. Uh, of course, you're intervening in people's way, lives, but not in any way that's supposed to have consequences. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to intervene. Uh, and uh, I think that the, you know, the, the, um, I was thinking the only time I ever tried to intervene from the cross-cultural research, we couldn't do it for political reasons. Uh, but we had discovered that a lot of people were becoming literate in Vi without a lot of time and trouble and money and dislocation or anything else. And we proposed to the United States and the Liberian governments that we, we uh, teach people in other tribes in the area, and by people, but people in other tribes as well, to become literate in using the by syllabic system because it worked for all these different African languages that mm -hmm. were nearby. It's, it's like, you know, the alphabet works for a whole set of Indo-European languages. Yes. Uh, so so um, we tried to, we actually, there was a lot of money to do that kind of thing. And there was a delegation, and there are people from the Liberian government and so on to, to, to look at this, and it could not be done. It simply mm -hmm. couldn't be done because nobody believed that the script and the language were detachable from each other. So that people, if it was a goal of person, they'd say, we, you can't give us the Vi script to learn because we're Gola. And we said, no, it doesn't. you could not explain. Even, even, even a guy with... A PhD from Liberia could not get it. It was really amazing. Wow. Um, so the language and the ethnicity were so tightly bound there that they just blew off the idea. But the real intervention was when pretty much we stopped uh, just trying to observe kids and we were observing kids in classroom settings uh, to taking responsibility for them after school. So in that sense, it's associated with the Fifth Dimension project because we didn't have the Fifth Dimension there when we began to intervene after school. Talking about the after school thing, yeah. and there we were intervening. Our interventions were small group activities around reading and computer time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was an intervention. That just straight out was. We were going into the after school hours. We were, we were taking kids who didn't know how to read well. We were giving them a treatment of a particular kind and trying to see whether or not we could really bounce things and to see whether or not our Vygotskian ideas would work if we could mm -hmm. have worked in that way. Um, and that was our first, that's, from that time on, I personally, uh, most of the research I've been directly involved in has been of, of that sort, where you go into an environment uh, where people say, well, it'd be nice if such and such a thing could happen here. It would be nice if there were an activity where that would help our kids when they were during the school day. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're busy after school, and if we had a thing like that, that would be a really nice thing. Can you create a nice thing like that? Can you find a setting that you can do it in? You can't do it by yourself. So then it gives rise to um, uh, activities. Um, 
that you didn't anticipate, and it begins a process uh, that we kept engaged in for, you know, I'm engaged in it today, and we're all done with it, and I'm still trying to theoretically understand what it is that we were doing and to broaden out the sort of theoretical perspective that comes to it, but it's all intervention. What's, what's different is that after, well after we had begun to do that, um, and kind of quasi-independently, uh, the, the notion of design research arose in 1991, 1992. Mm -hmm. Anne Brown and Alan Collins had each written articles about design research. And they, Anne, I think, in particular, noted connections to Vygotsky. But it was clear that this was what Russians called a formative or a transformative experiment that Anne mm -hmm. Brown was doing that she was calling design. And, and we jumped on it and said, oh, we're doing that too, and it's experimentation. So mm -hmm. we were just sort of interested in the ideology of calling it experimentation. And so we got a little, and we designed it. And so, and it was an intervention in that in the thing. And so, somehow, in the like in that in the 90s, our work and what people call design-based intervention research or design-based experimentation uh, converged. Mm -hmm. uh, and we brought to it our own kind of sort of uh, activity, uh, performance, uh, play world mm -hmm. kind of activity to it. Uh, and so intervention, in, I think we want to think about really the extent to when we do experiments, Vygotskyan type experiments, uh, to what extent are we doing interventions in people's lives? Very often we are. A preschool program is an intervention, but it's within an institutional context. And so I think that kind of, that kind of work, um, needs to be really thought of as Eugene Latusa is trying to do, as others are trying to do, in dialogical terms, where you mm -hmm. don't get into, I'm intervening in your life, you're not intervening in mine, mm -hmm. right? And what does it mean to be the subject of an intervention? And uh, insofar as we view these as, as kind of intercultural encounters, then we really want to try to think about the power relations that are involved in those kinds of encounters. What are we, what, when we're trying to do good with something, are we doing good, but maybe the people around us don't see it as so good. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 the, if you take the intervention seriously, then you have to start to, to question your own values. For example, if you're, if you're doing the fifth dimension in, as Katie King did in, um, uh, North Carolina, small town in North Carolina. It's a uh, culturally, from a dominant American perspective, it's a culturally conservative community in which they don't approve of the fact that the, the elementary school children and, say, college children are on a first-name basis, let alone that the person who's in charge, the professor, is like, call Professor Mike, or the assistant is called by her first name, even though it's an adult. Mm -hmm. and boys and girls are doing this stuff and playing together. They're in proximity and joint activity. And people looking through a window at this, so to speak, look at it and recoil because in their notion of how people should behave with each other, boys and girls should not be at that age. Yeah, we talk about the boys and girls the same age should not be. Right. I mean, so, so. So your activity within that, that cultural context isn't, doesn't have a positive value, mm -hmm. right? It may be from your Olympian perspective that you're intervening so that you can help girls become computer literate, mm -hmm. right? We actually believe that we wanted to reduce gender gaps in access to technology. Yes. But if you place this well-meaning Dewey-esque kind of uh, zone of proximal development, into the middle of a YMCA in a small town in North Carolina. Yeah. You, you're intervening in ways, and then you can see how if you're intervening too much, your intervention is expelled. The system expels it slowly. Mm -hmm. So the failure, so you can see the failure to thrive in that institution of the, uh, on the community side is uh, is it is it like like a, a healthy organism 
is expelling this virus that came in. Mm -hmm. Right? Can, can, same, yes. can I ask you, using a little bit different terms, but it feels like every time you created new activity, you needed this as a setting and con like you you did after school because you created the activities which they sort of expel from classrooms right yes that right. that that's a logical way i can see how you create that's why you not only create activity but you have to create the contents and then otherwise it'll go away right otherwise, so yeah so here this this connects with all of our work on when does the same task happen in a different setting Mm -hmm. When does a psychological experiment happen in a cooking club? Mm -hmm. When does a fifth dimension happen in a school? When does a fifth dimension happen in a boys and girls club? When does, and is it, if it happens in the boys and girls club, is it the same fifth dimension as it is that, as the one in the school? Or is mm -hmm. it, is yeah. it not? So all of those methodological issues that come out of the cross-cultural work around ecological validity and claims about sameness and how you draw your inferences and so on, they apply wholesale to something like the, the, any kind of uh, intervention of the sort of fifth dimension is where you're trying to, uh, to institutionalize it, you're trying to sustain it, you think it's a good thing, but the thing is its relationship to its environment. So the only way you can study it is to study it over time as it and its environment changes and then try it in a lot of different environments to get some idea of what's the what's the range of social ecologies in which of an activity of this kind can find sustenance. So it's a garden and an, a, a garden in its environment. Mm -hmm. That's why the garden is, is to raise children. So the garden metaphor comes back again, right? Mm -hmm. That for, in a Vygotskyan context, for us the garden is a zone. It's just a huge place where many many zones of proximal development are occurring and so and so and some of which you can document really well um, and some of which you can't you know because there's a lot of other stuff going on and your ability to um replicate and to record everything you can't record everything mm -hmm. you, know, you have to point the video camera somewhere you can't record everything so um so which creates this kind of issue all the time with how do you you, you cannot possibly uh, do the benchmark of success, right? Like, or, like there, is, there is no way you can use the best practices jargon as well, right? Because- No, no, because the practice, can't... right, right. The practice, and, and, the, and so that the failure of all of these attempts to, to for, um, but there's another term that they use, that all the elements stay stable. Mm. When you try to, you know, apply it in different places. And there just are hardly any, like, wh what can you think of, right? If we think of the main things when we started to do this, and Brown's was very important, that was an example of doing it. Uh, the work that people at Vanderbilt around uh, the Jasper program, where they had television and they had they had all sorts of complex, interesting, you know, everyday settings, but with scientific content and adventures and, and what have you. And then that was going to be a great new thing. And it all, it all then gets reassembled and brought into, you know, stuff, but it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, with uh, with Anne Brown and Joe Campion stuff, they could, because of the structure of the school and where they were working, they could actually do pretty nearly controlled comparisons between uh, a community of learners, reading group, and a non-community group, you know, whatever that they wanted to do. Uh, but they couldn't even get their friends in Palo Alto to replicate it, mm -hmm. right? So the, the ability to have enough structure to be able to make these measurement judgments it is a set of constraints, which if you can't recreate those constraints in this other place, it's not going to work. Yeah. It's, but you don't even know they're there until you try, right? You don't know which ones count and which ones don't until you go out and you try. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that's very interesting because it, it re requires us to think differently, like methodologically differently.
Yes. It, it, that's hard exercise for a lot of people because the tendency that is, oh, they were successful, let's just replicate it as is. It, right? but, but, but that means that the context in which it occurred is irrelevant to allowing it to be seen. Yes. Whereas if you didn't have the right context, you wouldn't see it because it wouldn't even, or, and or it might not be there, or it might be just a little bit of organization like um, uh, uh, kids using cell phones in classrooms to communicate with each other without letting the teacher know it. Mm -hmm. there, is a so, there is a pattern of social organization going on there, but all of the surface, if you just walked into the classroom as a visitor, a principal from another, I don't know, a professor visiting from the university, and you looked and you watched it for a while, eventually you see that the kids were doing this, but you wouldn't know how it worked, and the whole classroom thing is the official thing that's going on. A lot of the other time, there's just other little passing notes and so on, mm -hmm. right? But so it exists, but it's not seen until there's a, a a perturbation in the way things work, and it suddenly does become seen. So somebody gets a note and gets upset, or somebody's cell phone rings, or mm -hmm. or the teacher asks somebody a question at the wrong time, and then it becomes an issue, and then it gets then pushed down again. Well, let's get on with the lesson. Mm -hmm. And then it's hard to see again, even though it's still, it's that's very Bakhtinian sort of thing. It, I guess it's it's running underground in in some sense. It's yeah. not a, it's not the official discourse, but it's it's still it's still there. I I remember it was fascinating for the first time to hear you discussing two fifth dimension in one in library, one in boys and girls club, and mm -hmm. how one of the criteria. I mean, we can't even call it criteria for measurement. It was the noise level. Yeah. Right. That that was yeah. fascinating because those are little sort of like a right that diagram indicators, right? Right. right. That diagram is exa exactly you know it's this thing where the, where it's noisier. So you go because we sent students and they'd write back about what it was like you know and so it, it wasn't any secret anybody would feel it so it's. It, if you go into the fifth dimension and boys and girls kind of wild and sort of relatively noisy much more so than the library but if you go into the library you see that this is actually the library outside that is actually quieter so it's moving it in this direction and this one is actually quieter than it's outside so each of them is balancing off the two institutions mm -hmm. and then then the, 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 what you have to do on the internal organization of it is to organize play and educational work and interpersonal stuff with the undergraduates. So those different motives, they have to be orchestrated in order to produce a good local version of whatever the hell the thing is that you're yeah, but that, that's in this context we're discussing that here's the activity organized in the context which still attached to this, like say mainstream institution, say library, right? Yes. So and 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 your uh, judgment about this activity is by noise level, right? Yeah. Like how it, it's it's fascinating just because it's very unusual criteria to judge, right? Right. But, but it, was it shows us something. Right. But it was something that everybody could notice. Yes, and that it's illustrative, and, and it's a real life show us what's going on here. You yeah. can actually see it, right? right? Or feel it, right? Or observe it. But it's very unusual for any psychological or educational research to use this as a right. Know, so, as so a criteria. A of, right. So a lot of what we do is like outside of, in some weird way. It's a real developmental position, I think. It really does take learning and developments or that combination really seriously. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 um, it's not instrumentalized in the same way, right? So, and I think that's the thing is, is to the extent that we, we rely on the instrumentalism, then you're gonna get these various forms of regularization of, you know, and it, it goes with schools and it's the whole instrumental side of schools, which is being, it is being heavily is heavily influenced, but it's a different paradigm for thinking about psychological processes, and it doesn't compute well mm -hmm. right? and, until you start to go over into sort of more instrumental versions of which uh, which is a reduction of what the 
thing is going to be. But it's, it's not, not like the reduction isn't useful for a variety of purposes. Like, well, how much money does it cost to run that? I mean, there are, there are bureaucratic, there are institutional reasons why you'd want to have accountings of all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but the university, and we haven't even talked about the university side because there's a whole set of institutional changes in order for, to sustain the fifth dimension or any joint activity between institutions. We actually have in writing that our strategy was to try to change the two institutions. Mm -hmm. We're going to try to bring more theory and practice kinds of educational opportunities in for the undergraduates and bring richer academic activities in for the kids, right? And so that it, would, it would combine those two things. But in order to last, we realized that right at the very beginning that the two institutions would have to change in order to continue supporting it. There had to be some internal change to pick up the cost, but they could split it. So if one didn't have to pick up all of it. They could go get money together and they could sort of divide the cost and see, try and get it. Uh, so that was a, the sort of the big social change strategy that was sitting underneath it. In terms of what we're currently doing, what was really interesting or what's interesting to me now is that we thought from the very beginning about the university as an institution, and we thought about the Boys and Girls Club as an institution, but we never thought about the Fifth Dimension as an institution. Uh huh. And so what we have there is an opportunity to think from that very beginning thing where we slapped it together using mm -hmm. principles. We actually have a story of how it becomes, what, what it means by institutionalization. How does the institution come to organize up what people are doing in this distinctive way. So that's what I'm trying to work on now and going back and using field notes and our old reports because we have, we weren't looking at it from that perspective, except mm -hmm. when we wrote our reports to the foundation. But when we wrote academic stuff, we didn't write about institutions very much, just as background. Mm -hmm. we, were, you know, we say, well, we're connecting two institutions. But we never talked about the fifth dimension. As a, as a one. As a process of institutionalizing it. Mm -hmm. and what we were talking about was sustaining it. But to sustain it meant to institutionalize it. So at any rate, so that's exactly sort of, a, sort of the rethinking around, around intervention and, and its sort of two-sided nature in the way in which we're trying to get at, you know, get, get things in between, create joint activity around some common goals. Mm -hmm. Now it's, you're trying to do it at sort of multiple levels because you really want a good examples of the way in which the undergraduates and the kids are interacting over you know periods of time where you say, "Wow, that's great zone of proximal development." I mean, and the under, it's all natural. It's almost not entirely. It's, the undergraduates are mindful because of the lectures and stuff, mm -hmm. right? so they're trying to figure out what the hell does zone of proximal development mean anyway. Yeah, but they can think of it in terms of their negotiations with the kids. Who's in charge here? What do you want to do? What do you know? What do I want to do? And you can see these things. So you want to have the microgenetic stuff. But you do want to be able to show the parents that it's good for the kids. Mm -hmm. right? You want, right? And then it has to work for that local organization. Right? Yes. And then it has to work at a level that everybody can, can carry that weight. And... Uh, so um, I think here at UCSD, it's going to all wash away. Uh, but other places, it's actually, it's, it's institutionalized in the most important sense of uh, the person who started it has retired and gone away. And it's, it's, it's continuing to grow within the pattern that it initially, he initially set for. Mm -hmm. We have at least one existence proof, you know. That, for a lot of interesting reasons, is to the factors that come together that allow that to happen. Other places go 20 years, then a person retires, right? And nobody really is there. And that's like the lab. I think that's gonna, what's going to happen with the lab is the, the structure is there, but there's nobody who's actually involved mm -hmm. to be able to take it over and give it direction. So I think it'll, it'll, it'll just... Um, It'll, it'll limp along because uh, institutions change slowly. Bureaucracies get, take a long time to get around to it. But when they do, they'll just take that space and find new uses and new ways to 
divvy up the resources for academic work. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's and that's exactly right. So it's like twenty. You know, you institutionalize these things, and under odd circumstances, they coordinate people to do more complicated things than people could do individually, and they have a lifespan. Mm -hmm. And some lifespans are really long, like formal schooling mm -hmm. or families. Right, so family, I mean, kinship systems. Interesting, yeah. And some, some, so it's, yeah. Any rate, so I think that's where, so to, with the intervention stuff, I think that the big issue is who's intervening on whom? Is it reciprocal or not? If it's not, then then part of what's going on over here that you're, you're either gonna do violence to it and make it conform to you, mm -hmm. or it's gonna crack up, it's gonna change in some way that you can't anticipate. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a good way to find out how things work over there. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a good good topic to think about, and and to teach students about, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. Because the, there there is a risk, big risk to to intervene, not in, within the zone of proximal development. Right? That is that's right. I mean, where is it leading to? What what do you want to call development? Where is it leading to? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's the thing is activity theory can be used by fascist as well as anybody else so it's like okay <laughs> <laughs> okay as so, a technology that is activity theory as a technology once it once it becomes you know routinized or i mean it's a, it's almost like going from activity to action to operation it's like the operations can be replaced by machines now actions can be replaced by machines under a, a broad variety of circumstances you can get uh, machines that will engage in actions. I, I remember once when I moved to North America talking about Vygotsky theory as a more powerful theoretical tool for education. At the conference, one person surprised me by telling me, did I ever thought about who will get this more powerful tool in their hands? Yeah. I, it was a shocker for me, but that was in the context we're talking to. Right, it's exactly right. So once you get down to tool. Yeah. You know that that reduction. No, you need you need the triangle, and you need to see it at you need to see it as a dynamic dynamic qualitatively yeah. distinct system. You can't re reduce. You can't reduce it to the tool. Yeah. 